So, I like cats, but I don't have one. And I want to create something that can grab the attention of cats. How do I fix my lack of feline affection? Maybe I can establish a friendship with cats in my neighborhood? But how do I make sure the cats come to me and love me? And not run away? I guess I will need some cat attractant? It happens to be that cats evolved to like the catnip plant, which contains insect repellent molecules called nepotalactones. Since it's beneficial for cats to also be insect repellent, sensing the molecule gets them high and compels them to start rubbing their fur against a source of the molecule. That sounds like something I need, but I want it pure. So my first idea was to take the catnip plant and extract out the nepotalactones with a sock slat extraction, which is this device that you put on top of a flask and then you boil the solvent under it and the vapors will travel upward, condense and fall back down onto the plant material and extract the material and flow back into the flask and boil again and extract again. You get me? Yes, I did that, but it took several days to extract 200 grams of dry material, which was really annoying. I then dry loaded it all into silica gel and did column chromatography to try and separate out the nepotalactones. But it ended in a cat astrophic disaster and I didn't manage to separate it out. So after this had failed, my pride didn't let me abandon the project. So instead, I decided to define nature and make it synthetically instead. And so, I came across this paper that also uses a cool stable carbene catalyst to make it. Let's break it down into parts first. The nepotalactone synthesis requires three molecules that I need to make. 8-oxo-citronellol as the precursor, the NHC catalyst, and the oxidant DPQ. The catalyst is the majority of the work, spanning about 7 steps, but it starts with relatively simple reagents. Then the 8-oxo-citronellol is 2 steps from commercial citronellol. And the oxidant DPQ is one step from commercial 2,6-dithert-butylphenol. So let's just do all of that, even if it will take 100 years. I now have a mission. So to get started, I set up a stir plate and a flask with a stir bar. I then set up an ice bath and submerge the flask into it. I attach a thermometer to keep track of the temperature and an adapter with a small dropping funnel. I then add in 50 ml of concentrated sulfuric acid and 10 mL of 246-trimethyl aniline. It immediately reacts to form the solid bisulfate salt of the amine, part of which dissolves into the acid. A lot of it is stuck together, because I wasn't stirring strongly at the beginning, but it's not really a problem. I add some more sulfuric acid to dilute it a little. I then add 5.4 mL of 60% nitric acid to the dropping funnel. I slowly add the nitric acid to the flask, because the reaction is exothermic and I keep the temperature below 10 C. This reaction is a typical nitration, where the aromatic ring is nitrated with nitric acid in the presence of sulfuric acid. In more detail, the sulfuric acid protonates the nitric acid, which then falls apart into the nitronium ion and water. This nitronium ion can attack the aromatic ring and substitute a hydrogen atom with a nitro group. This is done at low temperatures to prevent it from nitrating in multiple positions as well as preventing any other side products from forming. After a while, the addition is complete, the mixture has turned red, and most of the solid has dissolved. I leave it to stir overnight to make sure the reaction is complete. And when I come back, it has become even darker. I dismantle the setup, and we can see the color is similar to the insides of a cat. I then set up a large beaker with a thermometer and some ice water. I pour all of the red mixture onto the ice to dilute it and keep it cool, because diluting sulfuric acid with water generates heat. I wash out the flask with some more water and stir the icy mixture. The red color disappears and it keeps becoming lighter from precipitating solids. I left it for a few minutes and it has become a thick yellow sludge. Now to destroy any remaining acid and to make sure that the amine is in its free base form, I keep adding a 7 molar sodium hydroxide solution until the mixture is alkaline. I set it in a cold water bath but the temperature increased too much and kept adding the sodium hydroxide solution. After a while, the mixture is alkaline and a bunch of solid has precipitated out. I then set up a glass filter with a paper filter on top and wet the filter paper with some water. I then start pulling a vacuum and filter all of the mixture through. I wash the residue with some more water and the product is left behind as a bright orange yellow solid. I then dump it all into a crystallizing dish but it's still very wet from all the water. So I move it all to a flask in a heating mantle and start heating it lightly while pulling a strong vacuum. This will pull out all of the remaining water. When it is completely dry, it becomes a satisfying free-flowing powder. I then pour it all back into the crystallizing dish, and the yield turned out to be 11.01 grams, which is 86%. It's a pretty decent yield, 
that is close to literature. And so the first step is now complete. And I will use this product right away for the next reaction. I again set up a stir plate and a flask and attach a thermometer adapter and submerge it in an ice salt water bath. I add in a stir bar and dip in a thermometer. Then I start cooling down 100 ml of 37% hydrochloric acid by pouring it into the flask. I then attach a funnel and add in all of the nitrated product I just made. I replace the funnel with a small dropping funnel and stopper the other neck. I dissolve 4.65 grams of sodium nitrite in 13 ml of water and then add that into the dropping funnel. I add the sodium nitrite solution slowly to the flask and keep the temperature around 0 C because this reaction is also exothermic and temperature sensitive. In the reaction, sodium nitrite can react with the amine in the presence of hydrochloric acid to convert the amine to a diazonium salt and eliminate water. In more detail, the nitrite ion can take up a proton from hydrochloric acid two times to first form nitrous acid and then the nitrosodium ion by splitting off water. This nitrosodium ion can react with the amine to form a nitrosamine and in the presence of hydrochloric acid will undergo multiple proton transfers, finished by the elimination of water to form the final diazonium salt. When the addition is complete, the mixture has become dark orange and I left it to stir for 30 more minutes. Afterward, I close the dropping funnel and immediately continue with the next step, which is converting the diazonium to a hydrazine. To do that, I weighed out 34.6 grams of tin 2 chloride dihydrate and dissolved it in 41 ml of 37% hydrochloric acid. I add all of it to the dropping funnel and then slowly add it to the flask while keeping the temperature below 5C. In the reaction, tin 2 chloride is able to reduce the diazonium group to a hydrazine group in the presence of hydrochloric acid. This reaction also consists of many steps where the tin 2 chloride allows the diazonium to take up three protons from hydrochloric acid to form the final hydrazine. During the addition, the mixture turns light yellow and it starts foaming a lot. When the addition was complete, I quickly replaced the dropping funnel with a small condenser so that it doesn't spill over. Eventually the foaming stopped and it didn't spill over. I left it to stir for one hour in the ice bath and then one day at room temperature to make sure that the reaction is complete. When that was done, it had become slightly darker in color. I remove all of the adapters and then to collect all of the solid, I filter all of it under a vacuum through a glass filter with a paper filter on top. I then remove impurities and unreacted reagents by washing it with a 4 molar hydrochloric acid solution and then twice with some diethyl ether. Now the solid still contains water and ether, so I moved it all to a flask, started heating it and then pulled a strong vacuum. When that was done, it became a dry light yellow powder. The yield of the hydrazine salt turned out to be 10.69 grams, which is 76%. It is a bit lower than the literature, maybe because it was foaming so much. Anyhow, the yield isn't that bad, and I can continue with the next step. So I added a big stir bar to the flask with the hydrazine salt, and add 45 ml of water to create a suspension. I moved the flask to an ice bath to cool it down to around 0 C, and added a thermometer to keep track of the temperature. I then gradually add in a 10% solution of sodium hydroxide to free base the hydrazine. I keep adding the solution until the mixture in the flask is slightly basic, which is the point where I know all of the hydrazine hydrochloride has reacted to form the free hydrazine. When the addition was complete, the mixture has turned more orange and the pH strip told me the solution was slightly basic. I then left it to stir for one hour in the ice bath to ensure full conversion. I then set up a glass filter with a paper filter on top and wet it with some water. I then pull a vacuum and filter all of the orange mixture through. I wash it once with some water and then twice with some ether, which washes out pretty much all of the orange stuff. I was then left with 6.23 grams of a wet light yellow solid, of which I assume the dry weight is 5.5 grams. This is a yield of 60%, which is slightly lower than the literature, though I might have washed it with more water and ether compared to them. Which is probably something I should stop doing, because I literally always lose more product, you know. Anyhow, now that I have the free hydrazine, I have finished the first part of the catalyst. So now I will start making the second part of the catalyst, which can be connected together in the third step. So to get started, I set up a flask with a stir bar in a heating mantle. I add in 65 ml of toluene as a solvent, 
and then 10 ml of 246 trimethylaniline. Then, at room temperature, I gradually add in 9.4 ml of benzoyl chloride. It almost immediately changes colors, and a precipitate forms. I then attach a condenser, and start refluxing the mixture for 16 hours. I also attach a calcium chloride drying tube on top of the condenser, to prevent moisture from entering and reacting with the benzoyl chloride. This reaction is a simple and straightforward condensation of an amine with an acid chloride, to form the corresponding amide and hydrochloric acid. When the reaction is finished, it has become a white suspension. I cool it down in a water bath, and then add in 6.5 ml of water, to destroy any remaining benzoyl chloride. I leave it to stir for 30 minutes, to make sure it is all destroyed. I then take the mixture, and set it up for vacuum filtration. I wet the filter with ethyl acetate, and then filter it all through. I then wash the white residue with some ethyl acetate, and let it dry on the filter for 15 minutes. Afterward, I was left with the product as a very white, crystalline solid. But it is still wet with some ethyl acetate, so I set it in the oven to dry for a while. And after that, I am left with 15.43 grams of the product, which is a yield of 91%. This yield is similar to the literature, and I can immediately use the product to move on to the next step. So I set up a flask with a stir bar in a heating mantle, and add in 20 ml of thionyl chloride. I attach a funnel, and add in all of the amide I just made. I replace the funnel with a condenser, and reflux the mixture for 2 hours. In the reaction, thionyl chloride is able to convert the amide into an imidoyl chloride, by releasing sulfur dioxide and hydrochloric acid. When the reaction is finished, it has become a yellow liquid. I then replace the condenser with a short path vacuum distillation apparatus, and distill off all of the remaining thionyl chloride. When nothing more comes over, I am left with the imidoyl chloride as a dark yellow liquid. I stored the flask with the liquid in the fridge until I was ready to use it. Now for the next step, I set up a flask in an ice bath, and add in 50 ml of THF that I dried with molecular sieves. Under a stream of nitrogen, I add in all of the free hydrazine that I made before. On top of that, I add in 6 grams of the imidoyl chloride that I made, and I wash the cylinder a few times with some dry THF. Then as the catalyst, I add in 5 grams of N-methylmorpholine. But I actually only needed 2.5 grams, and this was twice as much as I needed. Oops. The mixture immediately discolors, and I leave it to stir for 30 minutes in the ice bath. I then stir it for one day at room temperature. In the reaction, the benzimidoyl chloride and the hydrazine will react to form the coupled product, catalyzed by the base N-methylmorpholine, which is also able to take up the hydrochloric acid that it released. When that is done, a bunch of solid has collected on the sides of the flask. I then set the mixture up for short path vacuum distillation, to remove all of the liquids. When all of it is gone, a red-orange solid is left behind. I add in 50 ml of water to take up any salts, and then 75 ml of DCM to extract the product. I shake it around to make sure everything dissolves, and then move it all to a separatory funnel. Um, oops. Let's do that again. I move it all to a separatory funnel, and separate the layers. I then extract the remaining water layer once with DCM. I return the combined DCM extracts to the separatory funnel, and wash it once with some water. And then once with some brine. I take the washed DCM layer, and dry it with some anhydrous sodium sulfate. I then filter it all through some cotton, into a flask. I wash the filter and beaker once with some more DCM. I then remove all of the DCM with short path distillation, under a mild vacuum. And I am left with a brown orange solid as the product. I immediately continue with the next reaction, and I first add 10 ml of chlorobenzene as a solvent. I then add 11 ml of triethyl orthoformate, and 8.5 ml of a 4 molar solution of hydrochloric acid in 1,4 dioxane. I shake the flask around to get all of the solids off the sides, and then attach a condenser. I heat the mixture to a mild reflux, and leave it for one hour. In the reaction, the coupled precursor can form a triazolium ring in the presence of triethyl orthoformate and hydrochloric acid. In a quick, more detailed explanation, first hydrochloric acid reacts with triethyl orthoformate to eliminate ethanol and form the corresponding oxonium ion. 
This oxonium ion can be attacked by the amine of our precursor to form the intermediate coupled product. This product is able to eliminate another ethanol molecule by moving a proton from the amine to the ether. The resulting product exhibits resonance and can undergo cyclization by attack from the imine that is present in the molecule. Then, the following product is able to shift around its proton onto the last remaining ether. A lone pair from the nearby nitrogen is then able to move onto the carbon and eliminate another ethanol molecule. The resulting final product has a formal positive charge distributed over the ring that is stabilized by resonance and forms a salt with a chloride ion. When that is done, I take it off heat for a second and the mixture has turned red. I then distill off all of the volatiles and I am left with a red-orange solid. I then triturate the solid by adding diethyl ether, which will dissolve impurities but not the product. We can see a light solid separate out and the orange impurity is dissolving in the ether. I add some more ether and then leave it to stir for a few hours so that the stir bar can decrease the particle size by hitting the solid and to make sure as much of the impurities as possible are dissolved. When I come back, it is a yellow-orange suspension and when I stop stirring, the solid settles to the bottom and we see the orange-red impurity is dissolved. I simply decant off as much of the orange liquid as possible and then repeat the trituration process a few more times with ethyl acetate. After the last trituration, I pour all of it into a crystallizing dish and set it in the oven to remove all of the remaining ethyl acetate. Afterward, I am left with a cream-colored solid with some crusty bits and the yield turned out to be 1.58 grams, which is 17%. This is about half compared to literature, which might be because I added twice as much N-methylmorpholine before, and the fact that for the weight calculation of the added imidol chloride, I assumed it was pure. Anyhow, it will be enough to catalyze the reaction, to make naphthalactone. Now looking back at the desired reaction, we have finished the largest part, which is making the catalyst. Now I have to make the remaining two reagents, which are 8 oxocitronellol and DPQ. First, I will make the DPQ, since it is only one step. So I set up a flask with a stir bar and add in 36 mL of water. I then add in 24 grams of potassium hydroxide and shake it around because this cheap stir plate is crap. I then add in 25 grams of 2,6-dithert-butylphenol which has a melting point close to room temperature and I had to liquefy it with a heat gun since it was one big solid in the bottle. Then, as a solvent, I add in a total of 250 mL of third butanol but since this also has a melting point near room temperature, I had to wait for it all to liquefy, so I added it in portions because I was being impatient. After adding the first bit of third butanol, it gradually becomes dark red, and I left it to stir for a day. In the reaction, 2,6-dithert-butylphenol will oxidize in third butanol under the influence of potassium hydroxide and oxygen from the air to form DPQ. When I come back, it has become a thick brown slurry, which seemed to have stopped stirring because again, this stir plate is crap. I dilute it with some water and then filter all of it through a glass filter with a paper filter on top. I wash the residue once with water to get rid of all the reagents and then move it all to a crystallizing dish. And we are left with a wet red brown powder of DPQ. Now to remove all of the remaining water, I set it in the oven until the weight is constant. When that is done, it is all dried out and I remove the paper filter. To make sure the product is pure, I will recrystallize it. I add a 1 to 2 mixture of toluene and ethanol and heat the mixture to a boil. I keep adding more of the solvent mixture until it looks like everything has dissolved. After a while, that happens and I take it off heat and leave it to cool down to room temperature and then put it in the freezer for a while. A bunch of red brown crystals with a purple reflex have formed. So to collect them, I filter it all through a glass filter with a paper filter on top. I then move it all to a crystallizing dish and set it in the oven to evaporate off all of the remaining solvents. Afterward, I am left with 5.86 grams of DPQ as red-brown needles with a purple reflex. This is a yield of 24%, which is a lot worse than literature, but I think it was because my stirring stopped, so the reaction could no longer progress properly. Anyhow, it is still enough for the reaction, so it's not a problem. Now that the DPQ has been made, I will make the last required reactant which is 8 oxocitronellol. So I set up a flask with a stir bar and add in 20 mL of DCM as a solvent. Then I add in 30 mL of third butyl hydroperoxide and 10 grams of levobeta citronellol. As the oxidizer, I add in 0.36 grams of selenium dioxide and 0.92 grams of salicylic acid as the catalyst. 
and then leave it to stir at room temperature for three days. In the reaction, selenium dioxide can oxidize citronellol in the position adjacent to the double bond, which is typical for a Rayleigh oxidation. When selenium dioxide is used up in the oxidation, third butyl hydroperoxide will regenerate it, and the reaction can continue. The salicylic acid is said to aid in the breakdown of the selenic acid intermediate, but it was difficult to find out what exactly it does. This reaction also generates an aldehyde in the same position, which might be possible through a secondary mechanism. Normally for the formation of an alcohol, the selenic acid intermediate is eliminated by hydrolysis, but there is not a lot of water present and the reaction is done in DCM. So it could go through both mechanisms to form the alcohol and the aldehyde. Either way, both products are fine, since the alcohol will be oxidized to an aldehyde in the next step anyway. I come back after three days and the reaction should be finished. I then add 50 ml of toluene, which will help in azeotropically removing water from the mixture. So I set it up for short path vacuum distillation and removed all of the solvent. Afterward, I am left with a pale yellow oil that contains the product and some impurities. So first, I will have to remove some of the impurities and the remaining selenium dioxide and salicylic acid. So I add about 200 ml of diethyl ether to dissolve it all and then move it to a separatory funnel. I then wash the solution five times with a 10% sodium hydroxide solution, which we see takes out a lot of the yellow color. I then wash it once with brine to remove most of the water and put the washed ether layer in a beaker. I add some sodium sulfate to the beaker to take up any remaining water and then filter it all through some cotton directly into a flask. I wash the beaker and filter with some more ether and then set the filter up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the ether. Afterward, I am left with a pale yellow oil. Now I still have to separate out the products from the citronellol and other impurities. So I will do a short column. I weighed out 80 grams of silica gel and mixed it with 20% ethyl acetate and hexanes. I added all to the column and packed the layer of silica. I then put a layer of sand on top to protect the silica and run the solvent level into the sand. I then add all of my product on top with a pipette. I run that into the sand and then put more of the solvent mixture on top. I ran the column with this mixture until pretty much all of the impurities had come through. I then switched the mixture to 75% ethyl acetate in hexanes to get the products to come through. I then take the fractions that contain the product and put it all into a flask. I set it up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the solvent and afterward I am left with 3.4 grams of a yellow oil which is a yield of 31%. This is a lot lower than the literature but I'm not really sure why. I also did the reaction a second time and the yield was pretty much the same. But I managed to spill some sulfuric acid in one of my fractions while cleaning and it managed to turn it brown after I concentrated it down. So I'm not sure how much I destroyed because it still smells pretty nice. And so I used it anyway. Before I start the next step in this synthesis, I quickly make the reagent that is needed for it, which should always be prepared in the lab. And that is the oxidizer IBX. So I fill a large flask with about 800 ml of water and add in 362 grams of oxone. Then I add in 25 grams of 2 iodobenzoic acid, which is the whole bottle. When it has all been added, I heat it to 70 C and leave it to stir strongly for 4 hours. In the reaction, 2 iodobenzoic acid reacts with oxone, a strong oxidizer, to form the oxidizer 2 iodoxybenzoic acid, or IBX for short. When I come back, the mixture has stirred more clear and I let it cool down to room temperature, which causes a bunch of solid to precipitate out. I've put the flask in the freezer for a while and more solid has precipitated. I then filter it all through my dirty glass filter and force a paper filter on top because unfortunately my good filter shattered on the ground. I wash it with a bunch of water and some acetone and after drying it in the oven I am left with 12.82 grams of IBX as a white powder. This is a yield of 46% which again is probably because I washed it a lot more but also because I used less water to dissolve the oxone since I don't have 2 liter flasks or anything to heat that in. Now that I have IBX, I can continue with the next reaction. So I set up a flask with a stir bar in a heating mantle and add in a total of 100 ml of dry acetonitrile. I then add in all of the messed up product and all of the IBX I made. I then leave it to stir for 3 hours at 60 C. This reaction is a simple oxidation, where the oxidizer IBX oxidizes the alcohol groups of both molecules to aldehydes, turning both into the desired dialdehyde product, which is called 8 oxo -citronellol. Now since I kinda messed up in my brown oil, it makes the TLC smudged. So I'm going off book since I no longer have any idea if I have my product. So I will continue blindly 
and try to force my way to the final product. Because I don't want to do this 8 or so citronel synthesis a third time, since it takes like 5 days in total. Also, for context, the first yellow oil that I got as a product, I used in a previous run that failed. So I attach a short path distillation apparatus, I distill off all of the acetonitrile, and then swap the receiving flask, pull a strong vacuum, and increase heating to start distilling over the product. Some yellow oil starts coming over, which hopefully contains the product, but it is only a little bit. I take this oil, and assume it contains my product. I add in a stir bar, and then 25 ml of anhydrous THF. I constantly flush the flask with nitrogen in between steps, and add 0.24 grams of the triazolium catalyst that I made before. I then add in 1 gram of crushed molecular sieves. As the base for this reaction, I add about 30 microliters of diisopropyl ethylamine, and pipette it up and down a few times, to make sure it all goes in. Then as the last reagent, I add 4.4 grams of the oxidizer DPQ that I made. I wash the beaker with some anhydrous THF, flush the flask with nitrogen, and then stopper it, and leave it to stir at room temperature for 16 hours. In the reaction, 8 oxocitronolol is transformed into nepetalactone, under the influence of the triazolium catalyst, a base, and DPQ. First the triazolium salt is converted, into the corresponding anheterocyclic carbene catalyst, by DIPI. DIPI is a base, and so is able to take up a proton and the chloride ion from the triazolium salt, converting it into a carbene. Then together with DPQ, in an elaborate catalytic cycle, which I will put in the description for anyone that wants to see it, it will convert the 8 oxo citronellol into nepetalactone. When that is done, I set it up for short path vacuum distillation, to remove all of the solvent. I then dilute it with about 20 ml of 25% ethyl acetate and hexanes, and filter it all through a short pad of silica gel in a column. I take the red filtrate and again distill off all of the solvent. I then add 30 ml of methanol and leave it to stir for a bit, in which the reddish DPQ and its reduced product are not soluble. I then add 10 ml of water to make sure it has all precipitated out. I then filter the mixture with vacuum filtration through a Buchner funnel with a paper filter, and the red brown residue is washed with some 25% water in methanol. I take the light yellow filtrate and put it in a flask. I set it up for short path vacuum distillation again, and remove all of the methanol. After that, a bunch of yellow stuff and water is left behind, in which it is not very soluble. So I add some DCM to dissolve it all, and we see it becomes clear again. I then move it all to a separatory funnel, and separate the layers. I return the DCM extract, and wash it once with some brine. I separate the layers again, and put the washed DCM extract into a beaker, to which I add some anhydrous sodium sulfate, to take up any remaining water. I then filter this mixture through some cotton, directly into a flask. I distill off a large portion of the DCM, and now I should be left with a solution of DCM that contains some nepetalactone. But the only way to find out is by testing it on a cat. So I take it all up with a pipette, and divide it up between two vials. I send one of the vials to someone else, who does have cats, that have previously been responsive to catnip. Since some cats do not react to the compound, it is better to try it with cats who are known to be reactive. Also. I'm not going out to test it with random cats, because the material is impure, and I don't want to look like a weirdo going up to cats with a vial. Please enjoy the following cat footage.
so I guess it worked. Normally Pepper is an old man, who isn't so playful, but he seemed to really like the paper ball somehow. Percy didn't seem to care too much, but he's a poor boy with asthma, so he's probably just congested. So that was it for this video, thanks for watching, and as always, a special thanks to all my patrons. See ya!